Normally, uh, as you know, of late I've been having an opening prayer before I speak, uh, which uses the words uh, uh, in the written word and in the spoken word. May we always hear your living word. And sometimes I add as a little addendum to that living word, Jesus Christ, in case, you know, we've forgotten who the living word is. Um, but this morning, I think my prayer, I'm just going to, same thing, just slightly different worded. I want us to pray that in the written word and in the spoken word, we always hear the call of love. Amen. It's the call of love that I want to talk about today. So in the gospel from Luke, Today, we have one of, to me, one of the most extraordinary and provocative and perhaps not generally discussed widely enough verses in all of the Greek scriptures, the New Testament. When we have Jesus in the midst of expressing all this emotion and anger and despair um, uh, at all the kind of at everything wrong with sort of um, systemic human bad behavior going on in the Jewish capital. And, and he's, he's ranting about this anger and, and, and sort of shaking his fist at, at all of this kind of corruption and inequality and, 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 and the worst that are sort of, a, you know, that human beings continue to do. We continue to weave into our society all these problems of inequity and, and ignoring those who are struggling and placing those who hold cultural, religious or political or monetary authority up on high. Um, things have not gotten better. Um, and Jesus says the most extraordinary thing. He, he says, right, I'm coming. He doesn't say, come, I'm coming back to my followers and we're going to get grab a bunch of Molotov cocktails and we're going to burn this down. He doesn't say, you know, I'm, I'm going to coerce you. Do you know who I am? I've, I've developed a following. I pick up a bunch of disciples in the north and these are all heavy pipe hitting boys uh, and they're former zealots and then some of them carry daggers and they're angry and we're coming back and we're going to smash stuff. Did you, have you seen me preach? Have you seen many, how many hundreds and thousands of people wander up? I can come back here and I can mess things up. I can place myself in charge. I can bring this city down around you. No. No. No coercion. No threat of violence. No kind of big noting and showboating. No sort of the new king is rolling into town, people. Look out, Caesar. Look out, the priests. Look out, everybody. Because here comes the revolution everyone's been talking about. No. He says, how I've longed to gather all you children together like a mother hen gathers her chicks, chicks under her wings. That is not... If you were going to think of like... If you're going to film this as a Hollywood movie, right? If you're going to have this upstart prophet come to the city... And, and in, a, in, a, in like a demagogue fashion, proclaim everything that's wrong and proclaim that everything needs to change and everyone needs to repent. That is not the line you would write. This is, that is not the kind of, you know, Mel Gibson, they'll never take our freedom kind of macho, warrior, anthemic speech we would expect. It's a statement of absolute vulnerability, how I have longed. I have longed, I have yearned, my heart has hurt for this. So it begins with a place of utter emotional honesty, not a thing we are used to hearing from men in conflict situations. So from this place of utter open-hearted vulnerability, I have longed, I have yearned, this has hurt me, this is falling out of me. This passion comes from me. I have seen this suffering and it's spilling out of me. I have yearned. To gather all you children. And he has touched upon the common humanity there and he's compared everyone, adults, the old, the strong, the powerful, the greatest in that place, in a sense. The one that the world would say are the mightiest. And he said, no, we're all children. We're all children. We're all on the same plane. We're all precious and we're all loved and we're kind of making mistakes and we're muddling it along like the immature do, like kids do. We're rushing about. We're rushing about like there's no consequences and there's no tomorrow. We're just mucking around and we are getting it wrong. We need to be protected from ourselves. 
And what image does he use for that protection? But, well, for a start, a chicken. A chicken, kind of a humble animal, right? When you think of, like, can you imagine if back in the day when WA got its first AFL team or VFL team, was it back in the day, if they'd gone with West Coast chickens? Um, <laughs> not, not a macho, not, 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 a, not a bird that conjures up, yes, strength and might. I think a lot of us like chickens, a lot of us like to eat chickens. Um, but you know, a lot of us like keeping chooks and we all of us have fond memory of growing up with chooks in the yard and you know, um, I know I certainly do, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of having chickens around, but we don't see them as particularly glorious, right? We don't see them as particularly majestic beasts. Not an animal we associate with majesty, the chicken. Particularly like, not the, not, not the mother hen, not, not especially. Not especially seen as a proud warrior beast, um, really. I mean, if like me, you grew up with at least one angry rooster in the chookyard, then you had a bit of respect for roosters, or certainly a bit of fear of the rooster. Yeah, yeah. Um, our, our rooster on the farm was called Devil, just flat out. Um, <laughs> he, we started out calling him Neville, it became Devil very soon. He, uh, he had some anger issues, uh, very territorial, um, very protective. But hens, female chickens, they scratch around in the dirt and they eat worms and they cluck away and they kind of, they're easily startled and they have wings and they can't really fly. Um, but what they do is they nurture their young. That's what they do. If they're left to their own devices to brood on their eggs and the eggs hatch and the chicks are born and they have this huge... Uh, What's even the right term? Flock is not right, but there's this brood of chickens, these little tiny, fluffy, vulnerable things, which are so easily picked off by everything. Forget foxes, forget snakes. I mean, a, a rat, a, a big mouse could just about kill a chick. They are small, so small and soft and vulnerable when they're young. And that's what the mother hen does. She brings them all together at night, under here, under here and the wings go around. And under the mother's loving wing, temperature is regulated. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. The chicks have everything they need and they're kept close throughout the night. And they're bundled together, all together under the wing. No hierarchy, no sense of who's oldest, who's youngest, who's more important. No, here, under mother's wing, together, safe. And this is the image that this upstart, it's the opposite of every hero story, right? It's the opposite of every rah, rah, come with me, and we will ride on to conquest. It's the opposite of all of that. How I yearn, I yearn, my heart longs to gather you children together like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wing. It's so anti-macho, it's so anti-war, it's so anti-violence, it's so anti-masculine, literally. It's all nurture. There's no fight in it. It's the most extraordinary image, I think. Because so much of Christendom over centuries, I mean, literally, we had the church militant, right? Literally, we came up with the just war theory. Literally, we sang songs like Onward Sit Christian Soldiers. Literally, we sort of held up the God of Jesus Christ as this God of empire and military might and conquest. And we basically, we basically misinterpreted God and misrepresented God as the God of Caesar, as the God of empire, as, as the God of spear and shield-bearing legionnaires. And... Mother Christ, as Rosemary said today, the Christ who said, I yearn to gather you together like a mother hen. Completely lost in all of that. Because it's not a powerful story, right? You know, you don't become an authoritarian strongman dictator like a Vladimir Putin by standing up on the podium in front of thousands of people and say, come to mother hen. Come to me. I'll love you. Let's all be vulnerable together. 
Let's all be kept safe together. It's not a message that sells. Because human beings, when we're feeling scarce in anything, like Russia since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, they've been struggling. Under communism, at least, they all had a job, they all had a place, they all had a stable income, they all had enough food, their power was on. Um, everyone had a stable society. And communism fell and suddenly it was great for some. Some jumped on capitalism like a runaway horse and became very, very rich, very rich, um, and got to the top of kind of power in society. But your average working people suddenly struggled. There was suddenly no safety net, no welfare, and if you were out of work, you were out of work, that was it. And if you couldn't afford food or school for your kids, you couldn't afford it. Suddenly healthcare cost money. Suddenly it was a rough place to be. And I think a thing we don't understand in the West is so much of the Russian population got very resentful. Mikhail Gorbachev, we kind of celebrate that guy around the Western world, right, for being the guy who, who kind of um, led the former Soviet Union to the end of the Cold War, you know, who was there when the Berlin Wall came down, who was so collaborative and cooperative with, uh, you know, American presidents and leaders in the West. And he wanted, he wanted the threat of nuclear annihilation over, he wanted the Cold War ended, and he did an extraordinarily courageous thing in leading the former Soviet Union out of communism, out of its antagonistic stance against the West. And around the West we all go, Gorbachev, what a man, what a leader, what a visionary, despised in Russia by common working people. Because that began for them what's been invisible to us was decades of really, really struggling and decades of creeping inequality where they've seen people, often unscrupulous kind of criminal leaning people, shoot up to suddenly become the Gina Reinhardts and Rupert Murdochs of their society in record time. You know, in 20 years, go from some low-level crook, um, you know, on the fringe of the mafia in Moscow to being like a, a billionaire with political influence, owning parts of the media with the ear of Vladimir Putin. Some people have had that arc and so many others have just struggled to feed their kids. And people are angry. And along comes a strong man leader. Along comes the opposite to the mother hen. Along comes a man like Vladimir Putin, and he stands up and says, we will go back to the glory days. And suddenly the story in Russia goes, do you remember how good it was under Stalin? Under Stalin. And how they've come so far in terms of their own despair and their own anger that there's a younger generation going, oh yeah, it was good under Uncle Joe, right? And their older Russians going, no. He was a genocidal maniac. He was a murderer. He disappeared people. It was the most evil and corrupt regime. We don't want anything like Stalinism back. And yet you have enough people of influence and a strong man autocrat like Putin stand up and say, that's where we need to be. We need to be back to the glorious days of the Stalinist Soviet era. And enough people starting to go, well, OK, I don't remember that, but it sounds a lot better than now. And that's where you get to the kind of madness of this kind of macho, ridiculous, violent rhetoric. This kind of rhetoric that goes, going to war is right, conquest is right, that's how we win back what we want. You know, we don't gather the children under the wings of the mother, we send the children out with bombs and guns and missiles and they take glory, they take it. And glory is the answer, right? The call to glory. That's when everything is good again. And what Jesus is talking about today in the gospel, and I think what's obvious to all of us, is it's not the call to glory, it's the call to love. And not love as some kind of soft, nice, you know, not like love like I love strawberry ice cream, um, you know, or, you know, I love Marvel movies, not that kind of love, that kind of deep, powerful love, which I hope all of us have felt at least once in our life. The kind of love, maybe it was between you and a child, or you and a parent, or you, uh, maybe you had a partner for a time in your life, maybe it was your best friend, maybe it was a sibling, someone when you were with them, it was just there. This great, great feeling, maybe it was you and an animal. Um, 
you know, not all of us have relationships that have lasted for whatever way. Not all of us have easy relationships at home with our families, whatever it is. But I think all of us, all of us, if only fleetingly, have known a true love, a love that is mysterious, a love that is... This person walks in the room and they sit down with us. It doesn't matter how many years since we've seen them and something just, something comes to life. Something between our energy and theirs and our spirit now it meets and somehow a spiritual person like me would say suddenly God's visible, present and felt. Love is tactile in that moment. You can feel it in the air, you can feel it in the space between, in the words and the laughter, in the tears and the holding sometimes. But love is just present. And so when Jesus talks about a mother hen gathering children under his wings, I think that's the kind of love he's talking about. Because if the children of Jerusalem, if the children of Moscow, if the children of Wembley Downs, if all people in all places were prepared to live like that was the love they felt for all of life and all people. How extraordinary would it be? That kind of love, the kind of love that saw Jesus go to the cross, that kind of love. If we all felt that, if we all tried to live and to pray and to stay open, to the point where we felt that kind of love, then clearly, clearly, and it's clear to all of us, right, what's going on in Ukraine right now, it's just flat out wrong. It's just flat out wrong. There's no argument to be made. There's no justification. There's no, oh, but on the other hand, no. Because it is just insanity in the face of what love teaches us is true and right. It's just flat out wrong. It's just an absolute refusal. It's a deliberate ignoring of the call of love. And all human beings, we are born with that capacity to recognise that. And that, I think, is what we call the image of God in each and every one of us. Yes, we're biological creatures. Yes, we're very risk-averse. Yes, we, have, we were successful in evolving as a species because we can recognise threats. And we can recognise when we're running out of things. But we need to move on from here. Not enough food, not enough water. Oh dear, you know, there's, there's some predatorial... The matrix predators over there, we need to move on. We're very good at threat assessment. Very good at critiquing our environment, very good at looking around and going, don't like that, I'm going to change that, I'm going to adapt the environment, or I'm going to move over here. We're very good at that, but also, we have this divine seed inside us that goes, it's love. I feel it. I feel this and I want it. I want to hold the family together. I'm going to keep these people close. I'm going to hold this little community together. Because we're better together. We're better gathered under the wings of the mother. And I think sometimes we talk about love in churches, and maybe it's just me, maybe I'm the problem here, but I think sometimes, you know, I talk about love, and part of me goes, oh, yeah, 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 well, of course, of course love's good. And of course we're a people of love, and because we're the people of Jesus, right? So of course, love, yeah, 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 love, obviously, obviously. But then circumstances become so extreme, violent and lethal, like the resistance to love, in a sense, becomes so strong that it destroys people and it destroys the world and it breaks hope and it breaks hearts. And the children who should be gathered under mother's wings are looking around and going, does any of this make sense? Is there any hope anywhere? And that's when love becomes this most powerful mechanism becomes this incredible thing which must be unleashed and this call of each of us to show that kind of love and the courage it takes to take that kind of love into the darkest of human situations, that's huge. Because the call to love that we see in Jesus, the kind of love that we're called into, the love of God for us, that we're then called, reflect back out into the world. It's not namby-pamby. It's not a nice smile and a how are you and it's so much more. Because when the world gets dark, we're really required to burn so, so many candles of love. So many. 
to give all of us who are despairing, including ourselves, every chance to see that light. And so I suspect often I'm preaching to myself, so I'll say this out loud and I hope it's helpful to you. If, like many of us I know, you've been despairing over the state of the world in the last couple of weeks, and the situation in Ukraine could be a big part of that, um, the ongoing nature of COVID could be a big part of that, so many of us in our families and friendship circles and our community right now are struggling with really serious health challenges, uh, many of us are grieving. Put all those circumstances and factors together, and you might be at a point right now where hope is a difficult thing to hang on to because it's very hard to visualise what it actually looks like, how. It's very hard to analyse how things get better from this point. So maybe at this point, hope becomes active. Hope becomes the thing we do rather than the thing we search for, the thing we try to, to think about. And hope expressed outwards, hope enacted, hope behaved, is love pouring out and love driving our decisions and love driving our words and love being our example and love that reflects Jesus, love that reflects the love of God, the love that is God. So maybe hope is not something that we look for so much as something we do. We do it, we enact it. And it's not a case of fake it till you make it. Sometimes our bodies have to take the lead. Sometimes our bodies and our voices, our presence, our feet, where we are, our hands, our arms. Christ has no body but ours, right? So we enact love and we enact hope. And maybe then the spirit moves around like the wings of a mother hen, and we all begin to recognise ourselves as safe under those feathers. Amen.